Welcome back to the Cloud Plus um, 2024 refresh. This is Cloud Architecture part. Uh, this is part two of it. So last time we did those four. This time we're going to see if we can get to the through these four. Um, so I'll link to this down below. Let's get into it. Let's go. Cloud Architecture. So we're going to cover, explain the purpose of cloud native design concepts, compare and contrast containerization concepts, compare and contrast virtualization concepts, and summarize cost considerations related to cloud usage. Okay, so explain the purpose of a cloud native design concepts. So it should be resilient, agile, scalable, operable, dynamic. Um, this kind of goes back to the actually AWS well-defined, um, ooh, I thought I put it there, but um, I thought I put it there. We'll have to see, we'll keep going. Um, so as you compare and contrast containerization concepts, so we need to isolate things so that they can't cross over, okay? Uh, they should be efficient. So by the way, with isolation, you get more isolation with virtualization than containers. Um, efficiency though, containers are more efficient than virtualization in general because virtualization you have the OS. Containers, that layer's uh, not in there. So um, portability, they're both very portable, but containers are more portable because they're smaller without the OS. Um, Startup time. Containers will start faster because, once again, they don't have to deal with much of the OS. Scalability. Um, scaling VMs might be a little more resource, well, they are a little more resource intensive uh, than containers. Containers can be scaled up or down more rapidly, making them slightly more suitable for dynamic workloads. So key containerization technologies are Docker's, Kubernetes, Podman. Uh, these are all things that you can run uh, locally and often, oftentimes the cloud providers have ways of doing these. So for example, containerization in AWS. We have Elastic Container Service, ECS. And that's a place where users can run and scale containerized applications easily on AWS. You have Ela Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service, which is a managed Kubernetes service that makes it easy to run Kubernetes. Um, AWS Fargate has some uh, containerization. That you have Amazon EC2. You can actually run your own containers. Um, Amazon LightCell, a simple way to launch and manage containers. Um, they have some containerization in AWS App Runner, AWS Batch, and then of course they have Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS, which is a Kubernetes that's a fully managed open shift service. So um, yeah, so there's lots of options and I'm probably missing a couple. So cloud computing providers have really made it easy to do containerization. Um, so with virtualization concepts, this often comes into play if you're doing virtualization in-house, but you can do virtualization in the cloud. Um, oftentimes you're doing, that means you're running virtualization inside the virtualization. And uh, the more parts of that onion that you add, the more overhead there is. So uh, usually it's not advised to run too many layers of virtualization. Um, so with virtualization, you have hypervisors. So a hypervisor type one is a bare metal install. So this is like, uh, VMware ESX, where you install the virtualization on the hardware. There's no OS on it prior. Um, Hyper-V, KVM, I think are all similar uh, type one hypervisors. Type two hypervisors, you install inside of an OS. So this is like VMware Workstation, uh, VMware Player, um, Oracle VirtualBox. Um, there, there's a ton more, and I just, uh, Apple has their own, uh, Windows has their own, I, and I'm drawing a blank right now, but 
realize that a type two hypervisor you install inside of an OS. Um, so, and it's software. The interesting thing is they also even virtualize software nowadays as well. So you can run um, apps uh, virtually well, uh, as a service. So how is cloud computing different than virtualization? So oftentimes virtualization is about running multiple uh, systems or multiple OS uh, based systems on a single piece of hardware. Uh, now you can migrate them oftentimes from one piece of hardware to another, um, but you're storing the, you're, you're managing the, the hardware there. With cloud computing, it usually has a lot of different models. Uh, they will have some virtualization. Sometimes they'll even let you migrate your stuff in, for example, VMware from on-premise to your public cloud. Uh, not necessarily the best thing to do, but hey, if that's what you have to do, maybe it's your part of your DR, disaster recovery. Um, but uh, usually there's maybe a better way of doing it. Um, but it's possible. Um, but it, cloud computing often has a lot more options. So going back to that as a service model. So we infrastructure as a service, yeah, that's pretty, but you get the platform and all the way up to software as a service. Um, there's all these different options. And I really like functions as a service. It just seems cool. Uh, and we'll talk about some of that in, in, in a little later. But um, some of the challenges, you have to deal with uh, uh, simultaneous multi-threading and di dynamic allocations, things that keep changing. And then sometimes you oversubscribe. You run more than what you have. So it just makes sense. You can virtualize it and not everyone's busy at the same time. So for example, if you have a, a server, one physical server, you might be running hundreds of virtual machines on it. Um, and those virtual machines, you might have, say you have like 50 CPUs in your server, but your hundreds of virtual machines have a thousand CPUs and uh, your 50 CPUs is keeping up with that somehow. So, um, because it's oversubscribed. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing until it is. Uh, so we'll get into that a little bit. So when you're thinking about virtualizing, you have to think about what are the aspects of a computer. So you have the CPU, the main thing that processes, uh, tries to make decisions. So virtual, and of course the virtual side of that is a virtual CPU. You have the graphical processing unit, so the thing to um, display graphics. And oftentimes you don't need that on a server unless you actually are using the GPU to process. And we found that the GPUs are really good to do certain things, such as cracking passwords. Um, so you might want to use a GPU uh, for processing certain things. Um, or you might share different things or even pass through. Um, the, the graphics things. With clock speed, you have a certain number of instructions per cycle. You can change uh, how strong of a CPU your, your server needs. So for example, you might have the fastest physical CPUs that you have, but on your virtualized systems, you only uh, have them using uh, enough for what they need and they don't all need that blazing fast uh, version so you can download the clocks uh, do a smaller a slower clock speed virtually so it's taking less CPU cycles and other things can run so you can oversubscribe um, we talked a little bit about hyper converged where things are running in multiple places um, yeah, earlier uh, so oftentimes you also have the memory with uh, other stuff there's dynamic allocations and ballooning sometimes you can take extra memory for a short period of time um, so the, I, this is where I should tell you some stories With, of all the things that, uh, on virtualization, memory is the one I usually don't like to oversubscribe. Uh, the reason being is because memory is the biggest bottleneck. So, uh, think about if you're have this race and you're running it as fast as you can and you're using memory, then you're at full speed and 
if you run out of memory, you're handling it to a turtle or a slug, something really slow, because disk is so slow uh, compared to everything else. So um, if you uh, oversubscribe your memory, it's potential that you could be using swap instead, and that means it's using disk, and then it's slower. And that can happen on multiple layers, because you could be you could be swapping at your virtualized OS and swapping at your hypervisor le level and things just come to a screeching halt. So memory is the one that I have, n have not liked to oversubscribe because when I do, I've often seen issues. With that being said, it's been a while since I've been hands-on deep into virtualization. So I reserve the right to be kind of wrong at this stage. Uh, stage. But disks are still slow, and memory's still fast. Disks are not as slow as they used to be, but they're still slow. So just be careful. Okay, so we also should summarize the cost considerations related to cloud usage. So cost, it's all about how much you're using, and it's sliced into so many different things. Um, how much CPU compute, how much disk storage, how much network bandwidth, how fast the network needs to be, and also the maintaining of things. Uh, one of the things, sometimes people refer to these as hidden fees. Uh, they're not really hidden. Um, sometimes it's free to put data up, but to take data back out, it costs, or data going between different uh, regions costs. So the location differences. Also, you can even be charged differently for running a system in the cloud that's the cloud uh, availability zone or, or, or whatever is in a certain area, a region is in one part of the world versus a different part of the world. That often comes down to the cost of running it for the cloud provider. And energy might be more expensive. They try to do their best to find great places where they can get killer prices and run things similarly, but sometimes it just is gonna be a little cheaper, a little more expensive to do things in different areas. And you might have reasons that you need to do something in an area, because maybe you're a, a, a government and you will not allow your government's data to be outside of the country. So you have to run inside your country, and so you have to deal with those costs. So there, there's reasons why you may choose to have the, the higher cost fees just because location matters. Also, you want to have certain things closer to your clients and other things closer to your business, uh, depending on which one uses the most bandwidth for different things. So dealing with cost is a challenge. Um, you're switching a lot of your fixed cost with public cloud. Um, to for the, your fixed cost that you'd get from private cloud to a variable cost in public cloud. And that cost in the public cloud covers a lot of different things. So you have to be thinking about the total cost of ownership, which includes if you decide to go software as a service, let's say you move a legacy human resource system to a software as a service a human resource system you would expect to pay more for that software as a service uh, human resource system because they are now the ones that are managing the database, they're managing the backups, they're managing the patching. So all that stuff that you used to do, they're, they're now doing. So that total cost of ownership you need to understand. So when you're doing cost management, you need to be looking at the budget and the forecasting. Software as a service is usually pretty fixed, but the other layers have different variables. Uh, software as a service does usually have a per user variable. And there's some other limits that they, 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 you can't go over certain things or they'll charge you extra. Uh, I've seen it with, for, for example, API calls to do um, custom, customizations to software as a service, uh, custom bolt-ons or whatever you, whatever you want to call them. Um, and the API calls, if you do too many of them, sometimes they charge you extra. So just, Pay attention to your budget. It's something you need to learn and manage. You can forecast it and optimize your resources. Just because you want to, uh, 
just because something's slow doesn't mean you should add extra resources to it. Sometimes adding the extra resources can cause the slowness. Um, that happened. Um, one of the systems I managed, they wanted to have it be really big. And so we had it larger than, than it needed to be. And we usually actually had it twice the size of its peak. And they wanted it to be bigger. And in doing that, it was needing to cache more frequently because there's more processes that were running. It's just the type of system it was. And it, so it slowed down because it had to cache it. Every time it hit the first thing on that specific process, it now had to cache again. And uh, they complained. And one of the things that we did is we ran fewer processes, which used less memory, and it was faster. So, uh, but anyway, I digress. Uh, you should monitor and report. You need to learn and understand your systems so that if something bad happens, it, you, you'll know that it's bad. It's not, it's out of the norm and that you need to look into it. So should you provision resources or not? Um, when you, you need more processing power, do you throw more compute at it? Or do you throw more storage, throw more network? Or do you wanna tweak things and maybe consider different routes? things that are like cloud native. For example, maybe instead of doing, uh, creating another system to process things better, uh, you migrate your system to serverless and let the uh, cloud public cloud provider automatically scale up and down in order to uh, do the processing that you need. So uh, there's different options that you have. So uh, came to the end of part two. We'll see you in the next one, which will be part three.